Okay, um, good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening for those who join us from um, around. Around the world today, um, I'd like to welcome you to another Kemp Expert webinar series on migrating your data center to Azure. We are delighted to have Azure MVP Nicholas Bank and his colleague Warren Detoit here today to present um, this expert webinar. Before we get started, um, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, today's slide deck and recording will be made available to you in a follow-up email after the webinar. After the presentation, we will set aside some time for a Q&A, so please pop any questions you have into the Q&A box um, on your screen. On the left of your screen, you will see a resources section, which includes a link to a Kemp Azure free trial, which will allow you to test drive um, a Kemp Low Master um, in the Azure environment. Plus, there's also some other useful resources there. Finally, we have included um, a short survey on today's webinar and your own cloud journey. We would appreciate if you could complete the survey, which will help us to better understand um, you, our customers. Um, we're excited to have you all with us today, and we hope that you find this presentation valuable. Over to you, Nick and Warren. Thank you so much, Andrew, and welcome everyone to our webcast on migrating your data center to cloud. By way of introduction, I'm Nicholas Blank, and uh, what I do for a living is I either build clouds in terms of cloud architecture, or I migrate people to the cloud. So we either use public clouds like um, Azure, or we build folks their own cloud, be that hosted exchange or an iteration of what can be um, Azure private cloud, either via Azure WAP in the, the previous version or Azure Stack. And I have the privilege of working with Warren Dutoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, what Nick said, <laughs> basically do the same thing. However, um, my specializations are more in the open source side of things. Um, I'm a solutions architect. I also build Azure infrastructure, but also with a bit of a focus on development operations and continuous delivery models uh, working with Microsoft Azure. Um, I also focus a lot on the networking side, being able to connect on-premises to Azure and focus a lot on the hybrid as well. When we were thinking of the the first of um, hopefully what will become a, a series of these presentations. We looked at the kind of issues our customers are having, and we realized that if you're starting from the ground up and you've never done a migration to cloud before, you need to figure out where to start. And with that, we created an agenda that's going to talk about the elasticity and service level agreements of cloud and that and how that relates to the, the promises of cloud. There's a, a lot of promises from various vendors out there, be that infrastructure as a service or software as a service-based clouds, and we'll have a, a look at how service level agreements and elasticity relates to that. We'll talk about basic cloud-based data center design from the ground up for those of us who've never done infrastructure as a service in terms of a data center replacement. Most of us aren't born in the cloud, which means that when our business starts the cloud journey, we need literally a place to start. We'll do an introduction to Azure networking architecture, including ExpressRoute, hybrid networking, and DMZ designs. Then we'll move on to how we can translate existing on-premises application requirements, such as compliance, high availability, disaster recovery, <clears throat> uh, as well as understand the different migration approaches, including lift and shift, where, where we use platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, and how we can translate specific services that we use on premises to the ones in the cloud. We can, we're then also gonna go through on how you can create an application taxonomy, which allows you to document your existing applications and services and then create a roadmap so that you can move those applications and services to the cloud without any hiccups along the way. 
I thought we'd, we'd start with this. This is a, a fairly old picture and it still has relevance today. Often customers expect um, or have cloud expectations that are entirely mismanaged. Either they think that uh, a migration to the cloud is just something that, that, that happens and there's also a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt or, or even worse, unrealistic migration ex expectations in terms of how we get to cloud. There's been a lot of promise in the vendor landscape in terms of what cloud can do for us, but ultimately we still have to figure out how do we get to cloud and how do we do that in a supportable manner in a way that makes sense to our business that we're working in. So with that, I want to take a quick detour into the economics behind the promise of cloud. As a principle, cloud services are meant to be able to deliver more than their on-premises equivalents can, and can grow to accommodate further load. So if I'm consuming a mail service, for example, and my on-premises mail service is spec to receive a million items that I'm sending and receiving a day, I would expect that the mail service that I'm consuming that's cloud-based can, can consume multiples more of what I'm able to do on-premises. That will take into account loads and bursting workloads that I no longer have to accommodate. And that's part of the promises of cloud. Clouds tend to be on demand, both economically as well as in terms of delivery capability, which is what the elastic pins means. If a cloud offering comes to market, it should be able to handle many times more load than the on-premises equivalent service or be able to expand on demand, very much like the mail example that I've just used. That allows us to overflow all kinds of services but typically as islands of services. For example, if I use a virtual machine that's hosted in the cloud that I have uploaded, that presents an island of a service that's not necessarily connected to anything else. Of course, one of the many benefits of cloud is that we're able to offload our internal SLAs that we have with the business to the cloud vendor. If I have a back-to-back -back SLA from the cloud vendor to my business for 99.9 .9 or 39 availability, and the cloud vendor gives me a punitive SLA for 99.95 availability, then that counts in my favor. We know of cloud vendors that offer 100% punitive SLAs, but of course that depends on the type of service on offer, and the fine print is how the SLA is managed. Normally, that SLA starts and ends at the vendor's edge and not on your network edge. This is where the fear of losing a job becomes entirely real, where software as a service or another type can in fact replace a person or a group of people. If an on-premises exchange server is replaced entirely by a service-based equivalent, then some of the team or even the administrator may lose their positions or do something else since there's no need to monitor, patch, or backup exchange servers anymore. Obviously, infrastructures of a service can be entirely different, and this is where we look at our various tiers of services quite differently from one tier to the other tier. Continuing on from what Nick said there, the cloud-based services, the three tiers that we have, it is very important to understand the differences between the tiers and which one is used for what. That is one of the mistakes that we see quite often. So software as a service is exactly that, software, like SharePoint, Exchange, CRM, and it is generally available remotely, typically via the public internet, so HTTPS. Uh, so when it comes to those sort of on-demand applications that are hosted by these service providers, they're typically paid for in a subscription basis or per user model, and you get a specific group of services tied in with, with each other. You then move on to platform as a service, and platform as a service speaks to platforms, which could be software or services. However, it allows you to integrate your development of these particular applications or services. So for instance, if you have an application that relies heavily on Microsoft SQL, you could use Microsoft SQL on a platform basis, which gives you many advantages over running the SQL servers yourself. 
Uh, Azure provides a lot of platform as a service offerings. You can get SAP, you can get SharePoint, and there's a whole bunch of other guys that have gone and put these platform as a service offerings inside the marketplace that you can just spin up. Uh, the third tier here would be infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is basically the equivalent of what you would have on premises in a way. There are some caveats, however, your networking, your security, your legacy, your legacy operations can all be moved into an infrastructure as a service. However, this complicates your life since you then do have to worry about patching and you do have to worry about how your network design is thought out from the start and you do need to worry about scaling of the infrastructure. Hybrid cloud, the definition now, we put those two pictures in there. Uh, you've got a cloud and you've got an anchor. Unfortunately, when it comes to a hybrid cloud, you do always have a dependency on your on-premises uh, environment. When we talk about hybrid cloud, we need to have the on-premises and cloud talk to each other seamlessly. This is key. When we implement hybrid cloud, we enable the new and advanced features available in the cloud while keeping the stability and the status quo of the on-premises environment. It also gives us an implementation extension when it comes to timeframes and allows us the ability to move backwards and forwards between the cloud and on-premises environments in case we hit any speed bumps along the way. So you can always migrate something to the cloud but then rely on your on-premises stability to keep in tune. So looking again at the promise of cloud, but this time the hybrid cloud economics. It's a similar model to cloud, only based services, but with a big difference. We still have a CapEx versus OpEx model. We can rent instead of buy. We can buy services on demand, which we can use to burst or overflow our requirements. This can still include virtualization or compute capacity, storage overflow, databases, file or unstructured data, or even extensions of services like service queuing or workflow scenarios. To make it practical, in a traditional compute cloud, I would create and consume a virtual machine. In a hybrid cloud, I realize that I'm running out of steam on premises and I migrate the virtual machine onto the cloud platform, I scale it to the size I want and run it from there. I may keep it there or migrate it back to on-premises when I'm done. One of the big differences to our sysadmins is that sysadmins now extend the infrastructure into the cloud on demand as they need it, as opposed to replacing or upgrading our infrastructure. One of the big deals in terms of hybrid cloud is that we are no longer replacing pieces of our business wholesale every three years with the cloud-based equivalent. We are enhancing or augmenting it with cloud services. The last point here is transparency. The users of the system should not be burdened with the mechanics of this. And this is where Warren spoke about the transparency of the hybrid cloud services. Users store their files on something. That something uses a cloud-based mechanism to extend its own storage and retrieves the files the users need on demand. The users don't know about the mechanism or are impacted by the way that it works. Infrastructure as a service can be a complete data center replacement or it can be a massive improvement on everything in your existing data center. We need to bear in mind that you need to start with the equivalent of an empty rack. Basically, nothing inside the rack inside the data center and you need to start building everything up. Everything needs to be planned for, from naming conventions to access rights to what IP addresses are to be used. You need to plan the integration and the connectivity aspects of this quite carefully, including the physical or the logical network connectivity. This is a very common mistake that we see. When it comes to networking, 
one of the biggest mistakes we see is that people just jump in to jump in without planning and they end up with 45 virtual networks inside Azure and they don't have any way to remove route, route, route this to the on-premises environment. Um, also from a cost factor, gateways, Azure gateways, which allow the virtual networks to talk to one another can become a very costly exercise since you will be paying for the data that is transmitted between the two. Uh, when considering your connectivity to Microsoft Azure, Express Route as well, neat, great, great offering. Unfortunately, it does, again, need to be planned very carefully. Based on that, it uses private peering. Private peering means that you need infrastructure that supports BGP. So in order for you to route the information up, Azure, up to Azure via Express Route in a secure manner, your routing needs to support BGP and be able to advertise and receive routes. Site-to-site -site tunneling should also be considered when Express Route is obviously not an option, or alternatively, if you want it as a backup to your Express Route. Uh, if you're only using site-to-site -site tunneling, uh, then generally you should have two IPsec tunnels uh, via different internet breakouts for redundancy. Um, and then when it comes to storage, you must remember that Azure, service, Azure services for storage do have certain limitations. Um, if you'd like to manage your storage, if you want to develop, define your own LUN sizes, you need to manage the amount of IOPS for specific VMs. So you need to make sure that you understand what it is that you would like to do with the storage. Otherwise, it may end up costing you a ton of money. Along with the, the storage accounts limitations, and these limitations are documented quite clearly in the service descriptions that we have available for Azure, we need to take into account the virtual core limits that apply to a, a particular subscription when you start out. So every subscription is limited to protect the administrator and to protect the wallet of whoever's paying for that subscription. So that when you start out in Azure, you don't go and provision 2,000 cores as various virtual machines and bankrupt your organization or kill a credit card in the first day, let alone the first week or month. We need to take that into account in terms of our planning. So as we are aware of the service descriptions, we know how many virtual machines we can place into a storage account. We also know how many virtual CPUs we're able to provision based on a particular class of a machine. Now, these limits exist, but they're all soft limits. These limits can be extended very simply by raising a support call, and the Azure support engineers will gladly extend those to a reasonable limit. But don't expect the Azure support engineer to give you 50,000 cores on a particular machine type unless you are able to substantiate that and, of course, pay for it. With paying, we also take into account the kind of licensing that's available. So in Azure, previously we had metered licensing. And so in other words, I would spin up a machine of the type that I would run a, either a plain vanilla Windows server or a SQL 2014 server or a SQL 2016 server. And the license of SQL would be metered. So the meter would run on the virtual machine and I would pay for, for that machine per use. Lately in Azure, Microsoft has allowed us to bring your own licensing as well. So we're not necessarily limited to the kind of licensing that's available in Azure. We need to think of our virtual machine placements as well. Here in terms of the data center locations, for businesses that use a DC1, DC2 type deployment, or in other words, a primary, secondary, a live or DR type of data center location, we need to consider physics and latency. That means we probably are not going to run our first data center in the south of London and our secondary data center in Singapore. We would, however, consider having Hong Kong as primary and Singapore as secondary or two European data centers paired as primary and secondary. The Microsoft Core SDN network or the software defined network won't be a problem. The problem that we're going to have is getting to those locations from the outside, bearing in mind the physics taken into account of getting to those various locations. With that, we need to think about what about IPsec, so site-to-site -site tunneling, ExpressRoute, 
or even external publishing to those locations. And of course, if we're doing DC1, DC2 type of planning, how will our applications replicate and in what type of time frame, bearing in mind if we want to use these as a, a DR or even a HA type of scenario. In this slide, we wanted to list some of the areas that you would consider when moving applications and virtual machines into the cloud. We understand it's a busy slide, and we want to remember that effectively, we're talking about a data center re-architecture, or if your on-premises environment is a mess, the possibility of doing it right. With that, we're not going to go through every single word on this slide. Bear in mind that this slide is a takeaway, and this is also our criteria for most of what you should be thinking about when doing a data center replacement into Azure. With that, let's start with point number one. When it comes to point number one, we don't want to sound like stuck records here, but your network planning needs to include the entire network. You should apply many of the same principles in Azure as you would on-premises. You would start with the internal connectivity IP subnets, your gateways, the cloud equivalents of VLANs, and then move to the external side of the network, which includes your security, your demilitarized zones, your firewall rules, your load balancing, and obviously your DNS. The structure or micro segmentation in this case would allow you to also manage security and access to specific resources via the Azure resource model or ARM. It also allows you to segment infrastructure based on department uh, to allocate billing and resource cost of each workload to specific sides of the business. So if you need to build a server for HR, HR can pay for it because you will be able to determine how much that particular server is costing every month. When it comes to workloads and class sizing, this pertains on how much compute or processing you would need to allocate to a specific set of tasks, how highly available they must be uh, based on your recovery time objectives, your, your RTO, or your recovery point objectives, your RPO. Do you need two copies of a workload running? Uh, this can be separate to your scaling requirements, of course. Azure allows you to automatically scale workloads based on the trends that you're able to see in other areas, and we'll touch on this a little bit later on. Your encryption in motion and uh, your encryption at rest standards need to be considered if this is a current compliance standard, uh, as well as your on-premises certificate authority. Azure supports both encryption in motion and at rest. Using BitLocker and protected VMs in Azure is able to manage your encryption keys, and you can choose to manage this yourself as well. When we look at management and reporting in cloud, we need to consider what management and reporting means on premises. And these should be standards that we have on premises, and we'll talk about what those standards mean in a later slide as well. For now, management and reporting and with infrastructure as a service taking into account, is the extension of our on-premises data center into cloud. With that, we need to consider, we want to authenticate our infrastructure as a service-based services, and that would mean extension of Active Directory. We may then also consider moving various synchronization points that we have, say um, AAD Connect, or uh, Azure Active Directory Connect as a sync appliance, which is today running on premises, over to a virtual machine that's running in cloud. With that, looking at maintenance and operations today on premises, what does it mean in the cloud? If I have a virtualized data center, I no longer have hosts that I need to maintain. However, if I'm running infrastructure as a service, that means I still have guests that I need to maintain. There, I need to consider the Azure dashboards I've got available and do I use OMS versus my on-premises system center operations manager or equivalent service that I may be running. What is the place of monitoring? And consider that Azure patches our hosts, but not our guests. So with that, we still need to plan an effective Windows, Unix, and Linux patching strategy depending, of course, on the workloads that we're running. 
once a workload becomes redundant or in need of decommissioning, the onboarding and the offboarding or succession processes become very simple. We can turn these workloads off, we can save them for later, we can roll them back, or we can just retire them completely. And you would start saving immediately based on the fact that Azure workloads are charged for on compute times. So onboarding workloads can be done just as easily with all the migration options for Azure. And then when it comes to the development ops, operations lifecycle, tying in with what Nick said for point number six, uh, if planned correctly, Azure can make your life very easy using built-in functionality in Operations Management Suite or OMS. And automation tools such as Chef and Puppet can play a key role in allowing you to deploy and manage workloads in Azure quickly and easily. Development operations becomes the standard for operations and continuous delivery models allow your applications and services to change and update at a pace to support feature updates and bug fixes in all of your workloads. In your on-premises world, you'll have a lot of content, and you possibly have a data management classification and protection rules around that. Now consider, if you're moving from a Windows file server, and a Windows allows automatic classification of data based on file type and content, with that, sometimes encryptions of those files. What does that mean when we move from a file server to file services? In this case, for example, an Azure file share, which is accessible by several virtual machines that are running as infrastructure as a service. We need to think about what happens to the automatic file classification that we used to have in Windows file servers and no longer applies necessarily against what happens in that file share. With that, we have a compliance burden on premises that we need to take into account on premises. If I have a seam, that seam today is part of my compliance mechanism. That seam will consume logs and aggregate those logs, alert against those logs, depending on what that seam does. And we need to take into account that the various services we have within Azure can also generate logs. These can be consumed by seam services, but Normally, those logs need to be collected via a storage account, and we may have extra logic that's required to push that to our current seam, be that an on-premises seam, which we may need to think about how to move that to cloud, or it could be an outsourced seam that you are taking from a third-party security provider. We also need to consider the role-based access control model that we use, or in other words, the least privileged model that we want to consider for Azure administrators. In this slide, we don't want to provide solutions for all of these. We want to highlight that these need to be thought about extensively since you'll have on-premises equivalents of these. You need to think about what these mean in the cloud world to minimize your risk, to ease the transition to the new cloud-based equivalent of what you are able to do on-premises. In this slide, we're defining several infrastructure as a service and platform as a service type of firewalls, including a firewall type mechanism that isn't a physical firewall but acts like one. For the sake of definition, we're going to define a firewall as something that can restrict traffic based on either a layer 3 or layer 7 rule set and create a log that details our traffic flow and of course captures our firewall logs. With that, I'll ask Warren to unpack the three types of firewalls we have here. So we start off with network security groups or NSGs. NSGs and NSG is the main tool you would need to enforce and control network traffic rules at the networking level. In Azure, you can control access by permitting or denying communication between the workloads within a virtual network from systems on a customer's network via cross-premises connectivity or direct internet communication. Both virtual networks or VNet and network security groups reside in a specific layer in the Azure overall security stack. Network security groups and network virtual appliances can be used to create security boundaries to protect the application deployments in the protected network. 
Then next, you would have next-gen or current firewall appliances that can be deployed in Azure. In this instance, we find that customers choose a firewall brand or model based on the needs that they have already worked out. There's no reason for you to do this again. If you went with Checkpoint or Fortinet for specific reasons, this could be, let's say, feature-related or cost-related, you have the ability to stick with that brand in Azure. Well, for most of them anyway. But making it easier for you to duplicate your compliance policies easily inside of Azure. Then you would get the Azure Application Gateway. The Azure Application Gateway is basically a dedicated virtual appliance providing an application delivery controller or ADC as a service. It offers various layer seven load balancing capabilities for your application, and it has multiple worker instances for scalability and high availability. It allows customers to optimize web farm productivity by offloading CPU intensive uh, SSL termination to the application gateway. It also provides other layer seven routing capabilities, including round robin distribution of incoming traffic, cookie based session aff affinity, URL path-based routing, and the ability to host, host multiple websites behind a single application gateway. Then, something I'm just gonna add in here would be that you get an Azure AD proxy as well. This is currently in preview in the portal, in the portal version, but it's still quite available in the classic model of Azure as well. Um, and they basically, they, they help you support remote workers or remote users by allowing you to publish applications over the internet. The cool thing about this is that you can publish applications that are running on your local network, so your on-premises installation, and provide secure remote access outside the network, allowing you to push the on-premises applications through Azure to the outside world, and you can essentially then block off your on-premises installations from the outside world. In this model, we effectively are presenting the traditional equivalent to an on-premises LAN with an on-premises DMZ. And we give several different ways in terms of how that DMZ can be reached. And you'll notice that we are able to integrate infrastructure as a service as well as platform as a service type models and offer security as they are published irrespective of which kind of service that we're using. However, what if we need more? And by the more, I'm going to use a traditional DMZ type scenario where I'm accepting a basic credential that's originating from a user over the internet and that needs to be validated against an active directory credential. In this case, I'm using a Kemp load balancer as my validation mechanism and as my reverse publishing mechanism. I'm able to use Kerberos constraint delegation to integrate this device natively into Active Directory. So with that, I'm able to consume a basic credential and I'm starting at the firewall, able to hand that credential off to my application delivery controller and then therefore validate that credential against Active Directory. This means I'm sitting with very much an equivalent of what I have on premises. I have a single source of truth for authentication. I have a highly restrictive, highly controlled firewall model, which incorporates a traditional domain um, a demilitarized zone or DMZ. Now with that, I have an additional factor of authentication. I'm able to validate a device-based certificates from machines accessing my services that I'm publishing via infrastructure as a service to the internet against my on-premises certificate authority and therefore offer, again, another factor of authentication. So I'm consuming my on-premises credentials and I'm able to validate access versus my on-premises certificate authority. Now, Azure offers load balance. And those load balancers are great. And they've got a bunch of features. And they're great until they don't do what we need them to do anymore. Now, with that, we have to look at what is available natively 
and what is available via a Kemp virtual machine. And so here I've taken a view of when do I need a virtual machine that does load balancing versus when do I need the Azure load balancing mechanism. So in my mind, if I'm talking to an enterprise customer and we're doing enterprise publishing and we're doing the type of things that we normally do in terms of certificate validation, as an example, you'll notice that natively that's not available. However, using a Kemp virtual load master, I'm able to provide that type of functionality and therefore move my customer to cloud, especially if they're an existing on-premises Kemp customer, I can move them to cloud without sacrificing anything in terms of service delivery or expectation. Here is the Microsoft reference architecture for a tier three application. It's a really pretty diagram, even though I never drew this one. How do we translate existing on-premises application requirements such as compliance, high availability, and disaster recovery to cloud-based equivalents? We can have the same tiers we currently have on-premises, but with more flexi flexibility. We have resilience enablers, native and third party, and we can determine our RTO and RPO. And we can then have high availability within one Azure region, or we can have disaster recovery between different regions using replication methods. Failover depending on the workload. And if we look at this, we can either have this entirely as a platform as a service, or we can integrate it with infrastructure as a service. So in this scenario, you could have geo-redundant SQL, but have that in platform as a service only. And then you can integrate with always on, which will be on premises and extend the database. You can also have different application tiers as well. So you could have your, your business tiers and your web tiers separate so that you can keep the two divided via network security groups as well. We can also see that we are making this available across two data centers. So we have a DC1, DC2, or live and uh, eight, sorry, live and DR type of model. But in this case, we can actually run these two data centers active active. And we can see that we've got replication between the various tiers or equivalence between the various tiers so that whatever is happening in the application layer on one data center is also happening in the application layer in the other data center. Consider the average company that's never migrated before and they want the information or the intellectual property of how to move to the cloud or how the applications will be cloudified to sit entirely, or that don't want that knowledge to sit entirely with an external vendor. And here I've taken an example from Microsoft IT. How did Microsoft IT start from an on-premises landscape, bear in mind they're an IT department internal to Microsoft, and move their various applications to the cloud? They created a cloud panel. And here the cloud panel takes input from enterprise architecture or whatever that looks like inside your own company where you've got an element of architecture, takes input from the capabilities of third-party cloud providers and feeds that back into the business in terms of a capability model. They should understand their own particular business needs, things like governance requirements, support requirements, risk, strategy, and so on, and very, through a process of iteration, produce their own first and best practices. This cloud panel should be a representation of both business and technical people. And we want to create a two-way stream of information that creates a cloud landscape as that evolves in the business. So we would start in the Microsoft model with an experimental stage. Let's move our first application to the cloud. And this should be a low priority application. What does that look like? 
what are the type of learnings that we've gleaned from that move, what worked, what failed, what was disastrous, what was a success. And then we move to the migration phase and, of course, the operational phase for that particular application. And, again, as we iterate through this process, we have experimental migration and operation phase for each application as that moves from on-premises to cloud. Now, we don't have to be beholden to the way that Microsoft moved to cloud. There are other frameworks to move to cloud. And we need to consider that if we are an on-premises enterprise customer, we probably have an enterprise architecture framework that we subscribe to. In this case, I've modeled the Open Center Data Alliance framework and taken our example from that. Now, there's other frameworks like Gartner. However, obviously, I can't display something from Gartner as a proprietary business in an open slide without uh, taking into account the copyright that goes with that slide. So I'll stick with the, the Open Data Center Alliance as an example. Now, irrespective of the model that we use, irrespective of the framework, we have an origin. In this case, in the Open Center Data Alliance framework, we look at starting on the extreme left, which is legacy. So we start, everything is on premises, and we want to ideally move to the right. Now, bear in mind, this could be a representation of the entire cloud landscape in our business, or it could be individual applications. So with that, we could have an application, for example, sit in the optimized column on the far right hand. That means it is a federated application, it's interoperable across various clouds, or it could consume services from multiple cloud vendors, where we no longer care who the vendor is. We effectively consume services very much like electricity, and we run very open in terms of consumption of cloud services. However, we'll find that the business as a whole, if we're doing really well, will hopefully get to at least our cloud maturity model column two, where we are repeatable and opportunistic in terms of cloud adoption. Hopefully, most of our applications will end up in three or four. We find that very few times a business is able to move entirely over to the fifth column where everything is optimized because not every application lends itself to massive levels of optimization. So when we talk about optimization of applications that move to the cloud, we need to talk about how do we make this decision of what type of service to use. And here we would we like to apply a little bit of a guideline. Software as a service, before platform as a service, before infrastructure as a service. And I'll explain why. When it comes to future investment, the more we move down the line, the less automated we get and the more work and planning we need to do. When it comes to application migration, service adoption, certain exceptions apply, yes, understandable, but we can work out a base principle. We can say, is there a software as a, as a service solution available for what we're trying to do? Can we migrate whatever application we're using on-premises to the cloud and we can use it that way? So take Exchange, for instance. Yes, 100%, there is a software as a service available, so we move that way. However, if there isn't, then we look at platform as a service. Platform as a service, so we can use SQL, we can use web services, app services, SAP. We can take a whole bunch of these things and we can move them into platform as a service. Why would we do this? We would do this because all the patch management, all the scaling, all the hardware resources, we don't have to touch. It's not our problem anymore. So we can then move that way and it will be much less of an investment to keep maintaining all the hardware that the stuff used to run on. Then lastly, if platform as a service doesn't meet our needs and it's a bad fit, we can then build on infrastructure as a service. Now we can build on infrastructure as a service to obviously support our lift and shift uh, if we don't have any service translations over there. So if you have to, Take, take for an example, uh, Azure File Services. So Azure File Services will be a platform as a service, 
uh, service. And if, let's say, certain limitations apply, like file sizes and storage limitations, we can then say, okay, well, instead of us using Azure File Services, what we'll do is we'll use infrastructure as a service, and we will build a file service cluster inside, of, inside the usual virtual machine. To amplify this point, I've built a slide on application migration friction as it sits in my own mind. So on the far right-hand side, I can see an on-premises application that I'm deploying from net new. So I've got nothing. I've got nothing on-premises that this application can deploy on. Now, I'm not talking to a, a highly mature customer with lots of existing virtualization that they're able to spin up something really quickly because that's very close to infrastructure as a service. I'm creating a model that compares I have nothing and I have a net new application. So my, my new accounting application or my new application that needs to be deployed. So with that, we look at the risk versus time to deploy for a given new application which requires new services to be provisioned. We can see on the far right, if we have to deploy an application to on-premises and we have nothing to start with, the time to deploy and the operational risk can be very high compared to simply consuming an equivalent software as a service service. When we take this into account as well, when considering multiple parts of multi-tier applications that can be split and we take SQL as a service and a web worker role into account as an example, where we can very quickly deploy two platform as a services type services and deploy an application in hours or days versus having to buy the hardware for SQL, provision our virtual machines and license SQL, which can be risky if I have to take into account the supply chain that, that is required for ordering new hardware. And it demonstrates nicely why we have our founding principles of when we're moving cloud, we consider SaaS before PaaS, before IS. With the friction of my migration taken into account, we look at evaluating the various aspects of our application, including the workload that it represents, the architecture to build that application, the finances, risks, operations, and security parameters for an individual application, and evaluate that against our base principle of SAS before PaaS before IaaS. And if there's no fit, we consider either a hybrid cloud service, if that's an option, or if we need to shut our data center down and that's not an option, we may need to consider replacing or killing the application. Once we have this information, we can map that against the degree of benefits matrix on the right-hand side that creates a very interesting worldview on our applications. Now, that worldview decides how quickly we can migrate something. That evaluation of our application feeds into an application taxonomy. Now, every customer I've spoken to tells me they don't have an application taxonomy. And that application taxonomy really s simply is a list of all the applications we have. It demonstrates and documents the dependencies we have on on-premises infrastructure, be it physical or virtual, and other applications that we may depend on. And here we have a very nice example in terms of a web and a SQL servers and Active Directory if we are authenticating against Active Directory. That gives us a really nice matrix of classification, including on the right-hand side, start here and quick wins. So start here are the applications that should move to the cloud first. And very often these are the, with the quick wins, software as a service and platform as a service equivalent applications. These applications move to the cloud quickly and give great benefit in the short term with very little friction. Other applications are grouped into long-term bets and pursue later, which are relatively self-explanatory, but obviously would include a large amount of refactoring of the application to even allow the application to move to cloud. We may consider some of our long-term bets, for example, applications that are currently hosted on VMware or Hyper-V that are still running on a server 2003 guest. 
and that guest has no equivalent in Azure infrastructure as a service, so we can't even apply a lift and shift type of mentality against it because the base operating system that application runs on isn't supported. When it comes to application migration, we can take a little bit of a detour here. Let's say platform as a service and software as, as a service don't even apply. You guys just want to go to Azure. You want to replace that big clunky data center and you want to get rid of all of those costs. There are many lift and shift examples out there and Azure makes it very, very easily for us to do this. So you could use disk to VHD, which is an old school application from Microsoft, which uses volume shadow copy and allows you to just convert straight into a VHD. Um, unfortunately, Microsoft upset us uh, when they removed the conversion functionality out of System Center Virtual Machine Manager 2012R2. However, they did replace it with MVMC, so Microsoft Virtual Machine Converter version 3, and that does the job just fine. For a more automated way of doing things, you can use ASR. Azure Site Recovery supports a multitude of different operating systems and hypervisors. You would create a geo-redundant storage account, register the on-premises server, protect the machines, and send them over. Once they're over, you do a cleanup. Now, you can also be clever here when it comes to costs. If you're relatively quick, then the migration using ASR won't necessarily cost you any money because when you're using ASR, the first 31 days of any replication is free. So you can migrate that machine quite quickly at less cost and move on. Application migration, what about DevOps? So when it comes to DevOps, DevOps is a cultural and technical movement that focuses on building and operating high velocity organizations. DevOps began with web innovators who wanted to take maximum advantage of the cloud, which made it possible to allocate resources quickly and inexpensively. Traditional IT practices were not designed for the accessibility and speed that the cloud offers. Uh, your automation underlies all of the patterns and practices that constitute DevOps. An automation platform gives you the ability to describe your infrastructure uh, as code. So when infrastructure is code, you can eliminate error-prone, time-consuming manual tasks. You can standardize your development, test, and production environments. You can build automated release pipelines, improve cooperation between development and operations. Some of the areas of consideration here would be integrated source control into existing authentication mechanisms. So Team Foundation Server would be one of those things for Visual Studio. Um, your automated deployment slots and rollback capability in Azure Web Services can also come in over here. Your staging environments with backend scalability on platform as a service. Uh, integrated API services for internal and external applications, including mobile. Uh, you can have data factory integration, which allows you to move specific parts of your SQL databases up to Azure so that you can run machine learning on it. Um, that also dovetails off another area of Azure, but that's a completely different discussion, maybe for another webinar. Uh, you can also standardize development production environments and you can redeploy code whenever needed. So with that, we're looking for a place to land, and there's still a whole lot to talk about. However, in the interest of time, we're going to come to the conclusion for this webinar. So starting off with application migration, we need to have our application taxonomy. Without an application taxonomy, we don't necessarily understand the construction of our applications, nor can we understand the relative cost of what that application means in terms of on-premises, IOPS, CPU, memory, and storage, as well as what the cloud-based equivalence of that is. We need to understand how those applications interrelate to each other, and with that, we want to consider our founding principle of when we migrate an application to the cloud, that we move to software as a service before platform as a service, before we consider information as a service. When it comes to specific infrastructure as a service principles, uh, we've been given a gift. 
we've been given the gift of being able to replicate our physical environments in the cloud. And as with most, most gifts, we need to be grateful. If we ignore the physics behind the physical environments, we can run into problems. Network latency, increased cost, wasted storage, unusually com complicated network designs, and an abundance of unnecessary configurations can become a nightmare to clean up. Uh, we must also understand that you make sure the difference between Azure and the cloud or on-premises and your Azure cloud equivalent to your physical network service. An application gateway and a network security group are two very different things. And deploying the wrong service for the wrong reason could result in problems as well. As Warren said, the wrong thing sometimes at the wrong time can also bite you. So you'll find when you're deploying to cloud, very often you have to provision infrastructure in particular order for that to work. So for example, if you are making a application highly available using infrastructure as a service, if you create your availability group, which is a logical grouping of those virtual machines to prevent unnecessary outage during patching or maintenance operations, if you create that after the virtual machines already exist, then you have to redeploy those virtual machines. So we would want to create our application in, uh, in line with the, the physics and the service descriptions which our cloud service allows. Since this is the first time you're migrating, we want to emphasize that you need to test and plan. Understand the service descriptions, understand the limits of the physics that we're dealing with in inverted commas, and to the point of having our cloud panel, generate knowledge on a really easy application and reiterate on that knowledge as you move more complicated applications to the cloud. With that, we've got some time for Q&A. And Andrew, I'm assuming I'm allowed to pick a, a question and answer it directly, or do we take it um, that we answer the questions via the Q&A panel? Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions inside the Q&A box there, so if you just want to pick out maybe two or three, and we'll answer them, and then the rest we can take um, offline after the webinar. Yeah, with pleasure. Okay, so I want to pick on uh, John's question. What are our thoughts on the new managed disk approach versus managing storage? So I think managed disk is fantastic because I don't have to think about how many IOPS I need to provision into a storage account anymore. So a lot of that thinking just goes away. However, the unflexible side of things, of course, is that I have finite sizes and if a if a disk that I've already provisioned, so I can migrate a disk from unmanaged to managed, that will be rounded up from a costing point of view to the closest point of, um, of costing for that managed or the equivalent managed disk. So managed disks speaks to planning. It's great if you fit into the managed disk scenario. If you don't, then you have to re-adopt the storage account type planning model and rather provision your own. However, I think in terms of roadmap, I think it's a great addition to storage, and I think we're going to be seeing more of this type of managed equivalent managed infrastructure coming out of Microsoft where our administrators have to think less about what they're trying to deploy. Um, we're going to look at the question on subnet planning. Warren, I'm going to ask you to answer that, which is for subnet planning, do you have recommended network isolation patterns that you would recommend? Well, there are some principles that we applied in, I think it was slide number 11, where basically you create virtual networks first and determine how you're going to get your data to where you need it to be inside. Does it need to be in PaaS? Does it need to be in IaaS? If you need a DMZ. And within those virtual networks, you can then build network security groups around that. And then you could, let's say, apply a firewall, a virtual appliance firewall straight out after that. So depending, and then the nice thing about network security groups is that network security groups can include platform as a service as well. So you would be able to include a proper virtual machine along with its storage that it's attached to and a web app 
in a single network security group. So you could apply the same sets of security around those. Uh, and then you could have your Azure application gateways on the outside of everything. So you can build a DMZ within a virtual network uh, using a network security group. Okay, guys. Um, yeah, we have um, still have a number of questions there, but um, we're out of time now, so we'll... Um, link up um, with those people that ask questions um, after the uh, webinar. So um, I'd just like to thank Nick and Warren once again for their great presentation today. And I'd like to thank all our, our audience for joining us. And just a reminder before you go to just to fill out um, that short uh, survey that we have there. And we look forward to, to seeing you again um, in the coming months for another um, webinar. Um, so thanks again and see you later. Bye-bye.